Hey everybody, Christy Glass here with an epic Zoom. I am so, so excited because I met the Gray Sheep Company at Edinburgh years ago, and it's definitely on my bucket list of a place I want to visit because I want to see the little lambs and I want to see the farm in person. But this will do for now. We have Emma here from the Gray Sheep Company. Welcome. Hi. It's so great to see you. And you have some big news for us today, right? I have some really big news. Um, having been going since 2010, making yarns from our own fox, we've actually now invested in our own spinning mill. And I wanted to tell you all about it. Can't wait. Um, I put together a little bit of a slideshow for you so that you could see what we've been doing. We've got a really small farm. We're not um, fam sort of family farmers. So we got um, bought our farm about in 2004 and it was quite run down. And part of our um, sort of driver was that we wanted to bring the land back to um, being a small farm rather than just being sort of arable farmed um, by contractors and nobody really caring about the land or what was happening. So we've spent a lot of time sort of looking after things. And part of that was bringing the sheep back onto it. So these are the guys that we have on the farm. Um, They're so well, cute. <laughs> these are our Gotland ladies. And um, they've got some funky earrings in, um, good old government regulations. Um, so we have a small, well, we started off with a small flock of Gotlands and that's because they have such um, brilliant wool. It's a, a luster wool and it's quite drapey. It's almost a little bit mohairy and they're from the island of Gotland off Sweden and we've got the largest flock in the UK and they're rare breed here but they are real sweeties. So this, so, picture, of, this picture of them I'm seeing is this very close to being shear, shorn because they look very short here. Yeah so we actually shear in the middle of winter and um, that's because that the that time the um, fiber is at its premium to keep the sheep warm. Um, so we're getting the premium quality fiber. The only thing is that you can't then throw them out um, in the cold. So they come into the barn into thick straw to keep warm. Um, and it sort of works, but um, sort of it's got two benefits for us. One, we we're on heavy clay soils. So if they were out all winter, one, they would ruin their fleeces, but they would also tread in all the uh, grass into the mud. Um, so by bringing them in um, from sort of Christmas to March, it gives the fields a chance to um, recover. And we're really fortunate because we get the best, best fiber. So this is... Um, our sort of super weapon. This is Susie, who's our shepherdess. And she is the only female shearing instructor for the British Wool Board. Wow. And she has been brilliant. She grew up in farming. So she's taught me and continues to teach me loads. <laughs> but um, she's like, uh, she's like the Pied Piper for sheep. Um, she can just go in the field and the, the girls all follow her around. So this barn here, as you can see, is um, sort of being set up for lambing. And the lambs are lambed into small pens, so they mother up and we can make sure that they're feeding properly and that mum is um, being a good mum and there's no problems. And then after a couple of days, they come into the nursery pens so they can all bomb around together and, and play with each other, which is uh, really fun. And then you've got the expectant mums at the back there just waiting their turn. So it's a little bit of a sort of um, a, a factory system in one way, but um, we do all the lambing ourselves. Susie sort of oversees everything. So what's really nice with that is Susie decides on the breeding plan. So she can see the fiber and the sheep that are coming through. And because she shears, she knows the quality. And then we're working together at all times so that we see the quality right from newborn right through to the end process yeah now do the gotland sheep have more than one baby gotland sheep are very prolific um they normally have twins and they um sort of are like little bambies um long legged black with a white star uh, desperately sweet 
and very cheeky. Um, and then we have another flock, which is called our Steinfein wool flock, which is our own breeding, which is we've crossbred over the last 10 years, super fine merinos for the fineness and Gotland for the luster. Because merino is obviously beautifully soft, but it's a very matte um, fiber. Mm -hmm. So um, then the, the merinos tend to have one generally. So actually we, we sort of um, have managed to bring up their lambing rates as well. But we don't normally have that many triplets. But because we lamb indoors um, and um, Susie's able to really keep a close eye, we have very, very few losses, which is obviously what we want. In this photo then, I'm seeing the Steinfein mamas. Yeah, you've got a Steinfein and um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're all Steinfein in here. So, and then at the back, you can see the Gotlands with the silvery backs and the, the black heads. Mm -hmm. They're so cute. So then here's two little Stein finds. So we had our fiber tested and it, it's coming up about 19 micron, mm -hmm. but it also, it has a very, very soft handle. So they do not only micron, because obviously a fiber optic can be very thin, but it's not soft. Um, and they're coming up as something like a 99% softness rating. So that means that it's very bendy and strong and cozy. But they are a, a lovely waste of time when you go down to the barn. <laughs> oh. and, uh, Susie doesn't do it all on her own. This is um, one of her, her dogs, um, Nan, who's um, the matriarch. And she's just had a couple of puppies this year to get working with. But... Um, where we are very, um, we don't have loads of staff. It's Susie tends to look after, do everything with the sheep and I do everything with the business. So it's sort of, um, Nan is a really important part of all that. Nan. Right. So then, um, as I said, uh, Susie's um, not only our shearer, but she's a shearing instructor. And um, one of the key things about, um, the shearing process is when you have really good quality fiber or you you, you're shearing um, merinos, the, the skin tends to be a lot softer. So it's really important for us that we have somebody who's shearing that's really taking time to think about the fiber um, and making sure that the um, animal is carefully shorn and sort of comfortable so it's not like we have a gang of people come in and they just shear and if they get cut, then it's not a problem. It's, it's very much that Susie will bring 20 in. Um, so then they're not in the barn before they're shorn because otherwise they get um, hay in their fleece. So they come in in small lots, she shears them, it takes a time and it means that we get the best fiber, which is really, what we're trying to do is make sure that we have the best fiber at every stage and it's only through really caring for your animals and your land that you can go on um i think some people think that all wool is the same but if you saw my daughter's hair it's all sleek and gleamy and lovely and mine's all a bit frizzy and mad but that's because my daughter takes really good care of <laughs> and it's a little bit the same <laughs> rolling around in the hay but i have to say that i just finished working with your gotland and i did not find one piece of hay and normally when i knit with farm yarn i'm picking it out as i go not yeah. one not one piece well part of um one of the reasons the dogs are so um susie's sheep dogs are so important is because we don't put anything um, into a trailer to move it around the farm. Everything's moved with the dogs around the farm. So then the fiber doesn't get heated and um, rubbed um, or start to felt. All our fields were kept clean of weed. So they're not sort of sitting in burrs and things. Mm -hmm. And all these things, it does take more time and you have to be more onto the management but I think it, it benefits in the end that you get some really clean fiber. 
I think I remember you talking about that when we met up at EYF, when we were in the booth. I remember that detail and that's really interesting because I was thinking about how, you know, you have to take the time at some point. So you either do it at the beginning of the process or you're doing it at the end when you're cleaning it or the consumer is picking the hay out. <laughs> Also, I think, you know, and you know, it, uh, knitting is not quick. You know, even if it's chunky, it's not quick. And it takes as long to knit with bad wool as yeah. it does to knit with good wool. So you may as well have, you know, like spend the time and knit with something that you really enjoy and that you know is doing something good for the um, environment um, and that the sheep are being well cared for. Um, as to it has its own story so the story of our farm you know we're, our farm is um dates back we're on the old um harrow way so they, this is a road that goes from canterbury all the way down to the west country and it was used in um stone age times um and bronze age to get the tin from um sort of cornwall and we found um, gold bronze, bronze age coins. So it's a really historic area and it's always been farmed. So it's really nice to think that we're continuing that tradition. And then when somebody makes something, the story of what they've made continues on. So, you know, I think it's worth, worth putting the effort in. But what we've been doing is, um, We've installed um, a spinning mill onto into the farm, which Yay. is really exciting, which I've always wanted to do. Um, and um, it arrived in December. And this is um, the first stage of the process. As you can see, it's pretty mucky, <laughs> as you don't realize till you see the video, how the machines, but this is the Steinfein wall here. It's, as you can see how fine it is. And on the left is our dark side, and that takes us two years to collect enough to get washed. And that's all the finest dark um, Gotland and um, Stein. And normally dark fiber is much thicker. So a little bit coarser, um, but um, this is just really lustrous and soft. So this is the picker. So this is our first stage. And in this drum, it's a little bit like a medieval torture chamber. It's got great big spikes which rip open the fiber and blow it into this bag. And it's basically um, part of that is, as you say, like to get any little bits of hair or, um, you know, sometimes the ends get slightly felted. So that's, it puffs it all up. And from here, we go, oh, wait, there we go. Sorry, technical hitch. This is, so it goes over to the carder. And um, this is a bit of a beast. So you've got all the different rollers, which are slowly pulling the uh, fibers, trying to align them. And it comes out like a sausage. But as you can see, the fibers aren't aligned at this stage. So it's, it's quite time consuming. It only goes through the carder once, but then we have to put it through what we call the pin drafter. So this is a semi-worsted mill um, and you can see the different sausages, ravings coming in to the pin drafter. And then it's not exactly um, difficult to understand why it's called a pin drafter. You can see all the tiny pins. And what they're doing is as it goes through here, it's straightening the fiber so that when we spin it, we're pulling the fiber out and it winds it down into the cone then uh, the, the can and here you can see that it's a lot a lot straighter so first of all that one piece of machinery that had all the rollers it, it was encased with a cage what well, i've never seen that cage before part of um the reason we went for this mill because there are some uh, there is a very good uh, small mill uh, i think it's canadian um but eu legislation which we were in but um is incredibly tight um, and these machines take quite a while to stop and you don't want anything to get in. So to have the, um, the it needs to be um, caged and it, all the doors 
have sort of electronic latches. And that's the same with the picker, the first one we saw as well, because really you wouldn't want to think about what would happen if something got caught, even if it was like a, a you know, a scarf or something. Yes, okay. Thank so um, we, this is um, the kit we went for was, is Italian. There's very, very few people in the world now um, except China that are producing small commercial kit. Like a micro metal. Yeah, and part of the our main driver for this is that it is um, it's it's a mini commercial rather than a large hobby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it has all the safety features, yeah, which okay. is obviously really important. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Okay. So with the pin drafter, this is something that takes the most time because you have to pass the fiber through it about four times to get it all aligned. So um, it's not, we, we didn't go into spinning to sort of um, make our lives easier. It's just added more, but it allows us to really um, make sure that the, we're managing every element of the process. Emma, do you do any dyeing in the wool or is it mostly post? So I have historically dyed in the skein, but uh, with this now we could look at dyeing in the fluff. Yes. Um, and that's really exciting because it opens up a whole different range of um, the sort of textures and um, Flies. yeah, that you can you can play with. Okay. Um, we we sort of spent the last three months. We've spent the last three months really um, training just on um, th this kit and getting our main yarns right. It looks great. But it is, um, I'm, I'm terrible because I'm always sort of got my eyes on the next project before I finish the first <laughs> one. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could do it. Oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that. Oh. <laughs> so one of the things here is, um, I'm, I'm not sure how it works in the States, but definitely the small mill that was spinning for us, you know, he's getting increasingly busier and busier and it was taking longer and longer and longer for our fiber to come back, yeah. you know, up to 18 months, two years, which just is really just not tenable for us as a business. Unacceptable. So, yeah, I mean, it's great for him because he's like flat out, but so this, this allows us to do, you know, a lot more and actually um, keep sort of have it uh, like the sort of supply chain um, yeah. much more controlled. This, this picture we're looking at now, that's this wall, isn't it? Yep, yep, that's getting this one spun. So this is the Gotland and you can see how shiny it is. Mm -hmm. So this is at the back of the spinner. And then here we can see, I've slowed it down because otherwise all you see is like a red blur. But you can see um, you've got the, the wall coming in the top and it's being spun round and it's going onto the spindle. So... Um, it's it's sort of quite um, hypnotic. <laughs> yeah. so I think I must be the only person who finds this sort of stuff exciting, but maybe not. Um, so it's really satisfying, you know, when you actually see something being created that you sort of start, started from, you know, a little lamb. It's um, it's it's lovely to see the whole whole process go through. Um, so that's. A spinny and then oh I should have put this this I did this one just for you to show you that we do do some color <laughs> Love it. so you can you you were asking about color this was some that I played with and did dye in the fluff mm -hmm. and then um we were um doing some tests whether we blended it at the carder or blended it at the pin drafter yeah like which stage is best yeah and what's amazing with this is it's come out a really salmony color, but you're still getting those little pops of the pink and the lime green. Mm -hmm. which is, that's sort of quite exciting, but it's, you can start seeing the skill that um, goes into making, you know, that Harris Tweeds. Mm -hmm. It's just what colors you're adding in and what percentage. So that's something that we're going to look at working on. So then this is um, just the, the skein winder, which takes um, some of the 
um, hard work out of winding it by hand. Um, so here I'm just winding off um, some of the Gotland and I use this mainly so that I can dye it. So I'm doing the um, dyeing of the skein. Emma, this is such a steep learning curve. Yes, it is. Um, but I think the thing is that ever since we started the business, so we've been going, this is our 11th year. Um, I've always tried to really understand the fiber. Um, so I learned to spin and I learned to weave. So although we have had to learn the machinery, mm -hmm. actually understanding one, what we wanted from the fiber um, and the, the sort of, I suppose, the actual process of how one makes fiber mm. is, I knew a lot of that already. Yes, yes, yes. So what I'm, what's, what the main learning has been is trying to get the quality that we want mm. from the machines. Yeah. Whereas I think maybe sometimes people end up with um, a mill and maybe they're not big knitters or they've not gone through this journey. Mm -hmm. So then there there's they've got to learn what yarn they want whereas i know exactly what yarn we want that's true i get that um it's a bit maybe a bit more frustrating sometimes because you know you, you you're working to a goal rather than going oh hey i made something that's fantastic but actually i think in the long term it'll be it'll be better so um oh so then I dye in the skein, so um, we've got two sample dyes. One's, um, so sample dyes um, are like a tall um, sort of a stainless steel box. And they um, were used in the industry um, to test out different colors. Um, so I've got a six kilo one and a two and a half kilo one. Um, and I've had them refurbished because of course, there is no small equipment anymore, um, <laughs> especially in the UK. I, I would imagine in the US, a lot of the textiles industry has gone um, to the Far East. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things you do when you go to some historical town is see where the old mill has been turned into loft apartments, you know? Yeah. So a lot of the towns that were centered around textiles, they're gone, but that's why actually Harrisville is interesting because Harrisville, designs there in New Hampshire, they have sort of revitalized and saved the town and they use the mill. Yeah. And I think the thing is that what we're finding is that um, not last year, nothing happened last year, the year before. So um, 2019, we won um, the Farmers Weekly Diversification Farmer of the Year Award, which is um, the agricultural industry um, like it's the biggest awards and what was really nice is that um, a lot of our neighboring farmers have always been a bit knitting you know sort of hobby farmers knitting and actually without realizing that there is a different business than just growing wheat and these small farms are very valuable if you find a niche and do something different, you know, we can't compete with the sort of local farmers that have got two, three, four thousand acres because we've only got sort of 300 and most of that's woodland. Um, but the, the farm is valuable rather than just being split off. You know, if you look at farming in a slightly different way. So um, we also um, put out a uh, wrote a um, I wrote a book which has got some of um, sort of our knitting patterns in, but also it talks about the farm and all the knitting patterns are named after the fields. Oh. So when um, the, the tithe, um, it's called the tithe collection because the old tithe was you had to pay a tenth of whatever you farmed <clears throat> to the landowner. Yes, yes, yes. And um, the landowners were getting a bit fed up that people were like saying, well, I've only had um, three lambs mm -hmm. and you can't really have a tenth of three lambs. Right. Or <clears throat> as it, trying to control it. So in um, 1856, they turned it into a monetary um, amount and they 
basically they put, made maps and logged every single field and what every field was used for and every field had its name. So um, we have um, Bricklands, which is um, one of our big fields. And it <clears throat> was historically, they used to take the top soil off and take the clay and then pile the clay up. And then the following year, when it had broken down a bit, they would use that for bricks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite nice to actually track back um, a, as part of the heritage of the farm. So I just um, sort of did a range of um, patterns and that's been really successful. And that is that. Yay, I love it so much. So the mill has been in pr production since you said you got it last December, right? So we got it in December and um, we had um, training on it before quarantine and lockdown came back in. So we, we came out of lockdown, I think the second week of November and went back into lockdown, second week of December. And in a way it's been perfect because if all the festivals had been going on, it would have been a real pressure. Whereas actually now it's like, you know what, just get my head down and concentrate on it. So Susie's great. Susie sort of um, has been working on the picker and the carder and the pin drafter. And I've been playing with the spinner and um, the dyeing side of it. So it's really allowing us to do like a real farm to yarn whole story now. I love it. Now we're speaking at the very end of March, but do you have an official launch date for this new yarn from the mill? Well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the best planner. I'm not like you. <laughs> so um, I'm planning to launch um, first week of April and then right throughout April, we'll be bringing new yarns online and keeping people up to date with what we're doing and doing some live Instagrams and um, talking a little bit more um, about, um, you know, the fiber. And we start lambing in <clears throat> a couple of weeks as well. So hoping to sort of, now we're gonna be based here more um, until the foreseeable future, then, you know, it's like make hay while the sun shines, so to speak, we just get on and uh, enjoy being at home. So talk about this skein that you sent me. You sent me some yarn. So talk about this one first. Okay, so this is our Gotland Aran. And um, the lovely thing with um, the Gotland is that it's quite drapey. Um, it's, if you hold that up against, say, a woolen spun yarn, which is really bouncy. This sort of is just, um, but has quite a luxurious feel. Would you say, do you like, do you like the feel yeah. of it? Yeah, and actually I think it's so interesting that you're calling it drapey because I just used it and I was thinking it, it, it had really good definition. So it's really yeah. interesting, you know, I think because the Gotland is so strong, normally when I'm working with wool, I can break it if I don't have my scissor. I cannot break this. <laughs> No, it's so it, is, it is super strong. So strong, and, but then it's also soft. Yeah, so and one of the problems is, is um, as a spinner, uh, hand spinning is really difficult because it's very slippy and it's difficult on the machine as well because it will fall apart in a heartbeat. But if you overspin it, it just goes to wire. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in the past I've had spinners say, oh yeah, I don't like Gotland, you know, it's so coarse. And it's like, well, you have to, you have to be quite a skilled spinner to spin it by hand. Yes. But um, it also sort of, once you've washed it, it sort of has a bloom. You get a sort of a slight um, raise in it, mm -hmm. but um, it's also very warm. Yes. And really cozy. Yeah, I just feel like it's really, I think what we've established it is, is very diverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, What's quite interesting though is so th this this is a Gotland what they would call fur skin and you can see just by the way the curls and things it's very different to a traditional sheep's wool mm -hmm. it is more like a hair yeah. but it is beautifully soft 
and it takes the color really beautifully. Yeah, and it almost feels like an over dyed quality, kind of like it reminds me of Yak in that way, where the base isn't a natural cream, it has those colors. So, yeah, the colors are almost richer and have more to it. Yeah, you get sort of a depth because you've got a variegation in the fiber, and obviously the hand dyeing sort of gives you that sort of semi solid. Exactly. So, and so that's why we called the gray sheet because that's where we started. There you go. Now talk about this one. Okay, so this is a really soft yarn. So this is our Stein fine wool and um, it's about 19 micron, but what makes it feel even softer is the luster in it so that you get a really soft handle because sometimes you can get a fine wool, but it's crisp mm -hmm. and you need the, um, the luster that makes it soft. So this is our own breeding. Um, we went to, um, well, I went online about, I suppose, seven years ago and sort of typed in, I thought, oh, we'll get some merinos because we want a softer wool and also like to have a lighter base and typed merinos for sale. And there was just like nothing came up. So I then um, spent about a year and found some super fine merinos that were in the South of France that had been imported in from New Zealand. So we're really sort of a traditional stamp because in the UK, a lot of the merinos um, that are here are slightly crossbred mm -hmm. and because of the bloodlines, they end up being quite small. Whereas um, these were like big guys. Um, but, and it was a lot of work to get them back because nobody in their right mind imports sheep into the UK. So um, it took quite a, a long time to um, organize for them to come back and they had to have lots of um, blood tests to make sure that they were free of disease. And then we had to pick them up within 48 hours of the blood test. So we got the call to say that the blood test was clear and Susie and I got in her truck at four o'clock in the afternoon and proceeded to drive to um, Marseille in the south of um, France through the night, slept in a car park for an hour, went and had a couple of very strong coffees <laughs> and um, picked, picked the boys up, <clears throat> turned around and came home. Oh my. So um, it was quite a journey, but now um, there's blue tongue, which is um, a, spread by mosquitoes um, and now you can't have any imports from France or Spain so we were really lucky so we've got some really good um, breeding lines which was the start and by crossbreeding it with the Gotland then we get the the luster as well so, so why did you call it Stein Fine? So um, we have um, a wood um, on the um, farm called Stein uh, Cops and we we wanted it to have its own name because sort of say it's not it's not a cross as in um, it's not a blend mm -hmm. it, it is its own entity because we've now sort of um, developed the breed mm -hmm. so we thought actually you know we, we were going to change some people saying oh yeah I've got some of those and we're like well you haven't got ours so so we we registered um the name and it's our own flock and um it it's a closed flock so we don't we don't sell sell that them outside so cool. you have your own breed of sheep yeah <laughs> awesome. well i worked with some of your gotland and i will have a finished object video on this but i made this little hat. i just i just love it i just think that is i hope you're going to do the pattern for it it's it's someone else's pattern and I think she might be English. I don't know. I need to figure it out. But uh, oh, will you send me a link? Because I just think that is just brilliant. <laughs> well, I grew up in one of my ears is crooked, but I'm like a nerd, so I can't there we go. I grew up in Chicago land and Easter lands sometimes very early. It's late this year, but sometimes it can be in March and it is still 30 degrees. And so to me, a woolly Gotland Easter hat is perfect. 
<laughs> well, we, we obviously have like the Easter bonnet parade. I've not seen one like that, but I mean, like I, that is so much more practical. <laughs> Listen, this is it because when it is cold on Easter, it is so disappointing. And so this is my Easter hat made with the gauntlet and I just love it. And so see, I think that it actually, it, I did do it on DPNs and you're right, it's slippery. It's slippery okay. wool. So you have to kind of wrangle it in a little bit. But I think that the, the definition of the piece yeah. is really nice. And I yeah. think it would be great it, in a cable. And especially with an Aaron, mm -hmm. it really, you know, or like a twisted rib. Mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose, um, actually, I, I probably should have said that, but I mean, I do tend to knit it all. I, I don't use straight needles or DPNs anymore. And I think it's because it is so springy. I've just transferred over to circulars mm -hmm. because it it does boing off. It's quite strong in it. Well, it's obviously like strong, strong, yeah. but it's got a strong um, bounce to it, hasn't it? Yeah, totally. So it was great to work with. I loved it and definitely recommend getting it. I just think that the, the whole story you've shared today, to me, that's so meaningful to me as a knitter. And just like you mentioned earlier, the story lives on in my bunny hat, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just, I think I could imagine that would bring you joy seeing what people make and continuing the story on. And, you know, this is my pandemic bunny hat, you know, like it's its own object that has meaning for me that's tied to the land that you shared about today. So I think everyone should get their hands on some of this. And I will link to everything down below, your book, your website, everywhere we can get the yarn. Are you able to ship outside of the country yet? Yeah, we, we shipping um, to the US is not been a problem at all. Um, Europe's a bit um, uh, slightly trickier at the minute because um, it's, uh, the systems weren't in place on the custom side. So that's taking a little bit longer for our orders, but we, we ship out to um, the US all the time. Um, so, you know, that, that's not a problem at all. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's been an exciting journey. And I think the nice thing, whether it's knitting or doing what we're doing is it, it, you're just learning all the time. So it, you know, it, you never finish learning, which is what makes it so enjoyable, really. Mm -hmm. Well, I love my throwback sweater that I'm not wearing right now, but I used the base of that in gray sheep wool and it was so lovely to work with. So I'm a big fan and I'm so grateful that you put together this PowerPoint for us today and we could share it with everyone. It's so exciting. Congratulations on your new mill. Yeah, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see each other in Edinburgh again. Yes, or somewhere. I'd love to come to the farm. You know I will. Oh, well, you are welcome. Always welcome. I feel like the UK is my next international stop. And I'm just going to need to find someone to drive me there because I'm scared. If you drive around New York, oh my God, like this is just like easy peasy. <laughs> I'm just nervous about that. What is it? It's on the right side. I'm nervous. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today, Emma, and we'll say goodbye. Bye. Thank you.